Hey everybody, Happy New Year, Happy 2020. Uh, as you can tell from the title of this video, this is going to be uh, my favorite uh, games from the last decade, starting in 2010 up to 2019. But it's also something a little bit special because, little backstory, uh, I was at BGG Con and I was talking to actually Tom Vassell about this. And we we're like, how would you do like, you know, best of a decade type of thing? We kind of threw some ideas back and forth. I know over at the Dice Tower, I believe him and Z have gone through each year of the decade and talked about it from like a whole, diff whole, bu whole bunch of different angles. Uh, but lo and behold, when I got back from BGG Con, uh, a couple of folks in my group had already started like their own list of the favorite games uh, from each year. They'd started actually a few different kinds of lists, but a couple of them had started a game, you know, their favorite game from 2010, 2011, and so on. And I was like, that's really cool. And then, so I talked to them, I said, hey, can I include you in your actual name and not Billy? And, uh, you know, and then we can all do our list together. So I'm gonna give you my list, of course, of each year. And then, but I'm also gonna share with you uh, the top game from uh, probably about half of my game group. Not everybody participated. Um, and uh, so you get a kind of a sense of at least some of the folks uh, that I play with and kind of what their, you know, what really gets their juices flowing and their top games. Uh, and, and really, if you look at the top, you know, last 10 years, that's probably going to be a lot of your favorite games of all time. If something from 2010 or 11 is still in your collection, you know, it's something that you reflect on and consider it a top game from that year still today, you know, 10 years later, theoretically, that's gonna be one of your favorite games of all time, or at least, you know, near the top. So before we do that, I have a pretty sizable list of games, probably 15 or so, that uh, I didn't really get a chance to review or talk about last year. Now, don't worry, you know, if you don't want to sit here and listen to this, I'll timestamp, you know, the 2010 game and then the two, I'll timestamp everything. But I'm going to go through these really quickly. Like, I'm going to try to give 30 seconds or so to each of these games. Just if you want to get a sense, you know, oh, you played that game, what'd you think? So there's three here I didn't really like at all. Two, I'm kind of like, eh. And then there's probably, it looks like 10. Uh, that I liked, but I just haven't had a chance to review, to own it, whatever. Probably played it at BGG Con for a lot of these, and uh, and I'll explain you know, how many times I played it and stuff. So let me jump into that, and then we'll jump into uh, kind of the the top game from each year from the the decade of the teens. I guess you call it the teens. Like now we're in the twenties. So, but so let's jump into reviews. I'm going to cover the three I didn't like. Get those out of the way. Starting now. First one is uh, Fire. This is from Friedman Freeze and Stronghold Games. It's a solo game. It's sort of themed as if you're playing Space Invaders or one of those old 80s arcade games. And you're playing cards in these different piles and you're trying to build up numbers and blast aliens. And there's like levels and it's sort of a legacy campaign aspect. I forget what he calls like a fable game. One of his in the series of fable games. Uh, I got to like level four and then I said, I'm done with this game because I can, I'm in software. So I got to tell you that. And I, after I got to level four, I was like, oh, I can write a program <laughs> that's going to figure out which card to play every turn. And I know probably there's some other games you could do that with. I mean, how do they build AI for apps? But it was like really obvious. I'm like, this is like a bubble sort and you just move stuff around. And then you just, yeah. and I was like, oh no, <laughs> and then just destroyed every inch of fun that I might have had. And it wasn't really that super fun when I got to that conclusion. So that's Fire from Stronghold Games. It's like, all right, but it's just uh, it's just a mathy, it's super just mathy. It doesn't feel like I'm playing an arcade game or anything. I was kind of hoping it would be sort of like Friday, which he came out with a few years ago, which was a deck building game. This has some sort of, sort of deck building elements, but it's just not a fun game. Like it all works and stuff, but it's just not fun. Uh, the next one, probably gonna get some flack for this is uh, Wavelength. I see a lot of people really like Wavelength. And so uh, we actually played this at BGG Con. And I think the problem for me is that the problem that we had in this game was we had a little bit of an anomaly of a play, but it's gonna happen enough that it's going to irritate me and I'm not gonna, I don't, really, I don't wanna play it right now even. <laughs> so Wavelength, go look up a review on it, but it's this sort of codenamey social word game type of thing. Sort of, not really, but it's in that sort of ballpark of a social word game. You have this little dial and then you have to like sort of give a clue that links up these two words. So you can have like wet and dry, right? And then you're like the captain of your team for that round. And then you turn this dial and you look and your team can't see where the dial is. It's on one of the extremes, wet or dry. And you have to give a word that sort of tells them where, you know, the dial is. 
Well, guess what? It, this is an exact example. We got it wet and dry. It was all the way to the wet extreme and it uses like uh, water and then they turn the dial and then you know you reveal it and then you get four points if you hit it exactly and so on. In the game that we played, that seemed to happen every time. <laughs> Just about every time when you had like, you got you know your clue and then you got the extreme dial angle and then it was like, oh, okay, well, duh, obvious, go, next. And if it's in the middle, a dial's in the middle, then it gets a little bit trickier to give out the clue. And so those rounds were kind of fun, but just because it has that sort of thing, I wish there was some way you can make it so it wasn't like on the extreme, like it was sort of, you always had it sort of in between. There was like a sort of a wedge within a wedge thing, that there was some way they could mechanically do that dial thing to fix that problem because it just, I know it just for me kills the game and uh, for the folks that I played it with were like oh okay so if it's in the middle it's fun but then it's that's just a weird thing it's like so yeah it, it just would just fell really flat for us and you could say it's an anomalous play but just the fact that that exists just <laughs> irritates me so I don't want to play it again all right so that's wavelength um, and then the last one that I didn't like was called Nanty Narking I forget the publisher of the game. I think it's, I guess it starts with a P, I apologize. It's designed by Martin Wallace. And I think it's Phalanx Games, did Nanty Narking. And designed by Martin Wallace. And it's pretty much almost a port of the Ankh Morpork Discworld game that came out, I believe, from Mayfair Games uh, a while ago, maybe eight, nine years ago, uh, which I really enjoyed. I believe I did a video review for that one way back when. And I was really excited to try this and um and it pretty much is the same but the thing is is all of the graphic design and the color choices and the way that the board is designed and all this other stuff um and i think there's some differences but it's been so long since i played Ankh Morpork. but it was like and then the theme of it and stuff didn't really like fit and it, it, it's only because and i and i'm gonna say only but largely because i played Ankh Morpork a bunch of times back in the day that I was like, ugh, this is just inferior to that. Now, obviously, Ankh Morpork is no longer in print and you can't find it, and it, you probably won't be able to get this game again with the Discworld theme. I think Mayfair is completely out of business now, although they got kind of bought by Asmodee, sort of. I don't know how that works. Um, but, so, yeah. <laughs> so it was a disappointment because it just was like, I'm just like, I know this is inferior to Ankh Morpork. And the folks I played it with that hadn't played Ankh Morpork before were you know they're like oh this is a neat game and it is kind of a neat mechanical game but man it just is like night and day inferior to Ankh Morpork in terms of theme graphic design the artwork everything it just is like no I don't I don't want to play this because I know this thing is out there and it really is a deterrent like it's bad like it's, it's like gameplay affecting uh graphic design and stuff like that um and so yeah so that's the other one that's a negative i guess it's not really a negative because if you could get over that you, you'd have a good time probably playing the game but i would i'd probably go look up and try to find Ankh Morpork as long, as long as you weren't paying like 100 bucks for it you know if you could find it for like 60 bucks you know i would pay that for it and you know get some plays out of it uh, but anyway that's nancy narking and then the next two those are the three i just like was really like no thanks at all the next two are, I'm kind of on the fence about, but uh, you know, I've got a bunch of other games that I'm gonna talk about that I'm not even gonna probably review ever, or maybe even play again that are great. I'll accept a couple of these. And then, you know, there's all these games I talk about in my best of the year list, so why bother with these two <laughs> kind of thing. But these are, I think, are pretty decent games, and I think some folks will really like them, so I'm gonna mention them. So the first one is Paranormal Detective, uh, which is a really, really interesting game, um, but, it was also like a little boring like uh, you know i get kind of hung up about the term downtime but there is like a good amount of downtime so what this idea is it's sort of like mysterium there's a ghost and they're trying to sort of uh um you know inform you about the crime and how they died it may, may not even actually be a crime it could have been an accident that kind of thing and there's all these kind of weird and interesting uh mini games to kind of tell have the ghost tell players uh, who's trying, you know, what happened and all this stuff. So there's various different kinds of clues and there's different kinds of things like you might go and draw on somebody's back. So they can't see what you're drawing, but they can kind of feel what they're drawing. And they'll do other things and like you'll like, sometimes they'll draw a picture and then they'll control your hand. And then there's some other different, there's some weird kind of interesting socially geared miniature games. It's not all drawing, although those are the, those are the two examples I used. Uh, but, and then you're trying to do it. And so it's a race though from the other players to sort of guess it 
and I, I can't remember the exact rule with, you know, if the ghost wins or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just a little bit on the boring side and there was some, enough ambiguity in some of the clues and the reasoning of the case and sort of like lining up people's answers with what the ghost knew as the answers, uh, that was sort of, sort of a little bit irritating. And, uh, you know, like, you know, last year I played Detective Club and really enjoyed that. I'd probably rather play Detective Club than this, um, you know, just by a little bit. So it's, it's just kind of a weird game, but I think it's something that I would recommend people try because you might actually love it. And I think it's good and designed well and everything. It's just some weird sort of just kind of nitpicky things, but that kind of just bothered me about it. And, uh, and maybe it was this particular case that we played, but uh, worth looking into, maybe trying it before you buy it on Paranormal Detective. And the last one, kind of middling one I would give is uh, Mississippi Queen, which unfortunately I was really looking forward to Mississippi Queen. Uh, and frankly, uh, playing a couple of games that are gonna be talked about in just a second, and some other games that I've played recently, which I'll get a chance to review here in a month or maybe even next month, actually. Um, it's just like, oh, okay, this is an older design. So Mississippi Queen is you're racing these little tugboats type, type of things around and picking up passengers. And then the board is, you're, you're racing on the Mississippi River and the board's kind of naturally evolving and going different ways. You don't know how it's gonna go. And you've got to control like the amount of sort of acceleration of your boat with the with the coal. There's like dials on your boat, which is interesting. And then you can like run into stuff and then there's some expansion stuff that you can do to like, you know, pirate other boats, oh, excuse me, pilot other boats and stuff like that. And I was really looking forward to it because it's an old, I believe, Spill the Jars winner. It's an older game. It's, it's, it's been out of print for a while and I've wanted to try it because I like the idea of like having this boat that might be out of control and you're trying to sort of worm it around and stuff like that. Now I will say, this is the double-edged sword of it. It's not really that fun and exciting with like three players, it's, you know, or less. <laughs> it's just not that interesting of a game. But once you start to add more boats to the board, it gets really chaotic and interesting and fun, but it also can be really frustrating because you just, a lot of times you're like, oh, I just, I do almost nothing on my turn. That can happen. And, and that's not really frustrating for me, honestly, but I've played it with people that it was like a real like deal breaker. And then that sort of energy just makes me not want to play the game at all. And we're talking about like in a family setting even. So yeah, so, but there's other games where you have this sort of positional racing kind of element thing that are just better games these days. So again, like it's not terrible. It has some fun, interesting, kind of exciting moments, but there's also like a lot of frustration and stuff like that with some of the mechanics on Mississippi Queen. Okay, so those are kind of all the games that I, I didn't really like or kind of middling on. And now we'll get into a bunch of games that I really did like. And I may review these one day, I may not. So the next one is Ragusa. And just a reminder, if you get sick of this, there's a timestamp to go to the top 10. Ragusa, is from Capstone Games. Had a chance to play this. Very clean, uh, simple mechanics, abstract game. Definitely go Google or go to BGG and pull up a video review on the mechanics. I don't wanna get stuck into that here. But it's really clean and sharp and quick and has some good amount of strategy and has some really interesting sort of spatial dynamics with the board. It's very, very abstract, but somehow the theme kind of gets across a little bit. You know, it's abstract, but the theme is there. And I really had a good time with it. And I just, I recommend this game. Uh, folks, definitely check it out and pick it up. It's a small design. It's not like a huge heavy game, like a lot of Capstone games. This is kind of in that, uh, I was called middle light because it's definitely towards the lower lighter end. And it's uh, probably a good kind of, you know, family style game uh, if folks are into kind of a little bit, something more abstract and Euro-y in your family. Uh, but that's Ragusa, and I def definitely recommend folks uh, take a look at that one. Definitely go watch a review on it though, or a how to play or something. See if that vibes with you. But to me, it really does what it kind of markets itself as. Uh, so that's Ragusa. The next one is Fast Sloths, which redemption. <laughs> I didn't like Fire from Friedman Freeze and Stronghold Games, but I really do like Fast Sloth. I played this a few times at BGG Con. I think just three and four players. I didn't get a chance to play two. No, because we were gonna play two, but then another guy sat down. So three and four players, I haven't played with five. Uh, really inventive and interesting game. I believe it's a lot like Elfenland. I think that's their game, but it does some things different with that. So if you've played Elfenland, which I haven't, uh, it's kind of in that same ballpark. But having not played Elfenland, don't really care anything about Elfenland. 
Fast Loss is a really cool, interesting racing game with a, with a real kind of different kind of vibe on a deck building mechanic that's very, very different. I even hesitate to call it deck building. I mean, it is, but if you're like familiar with, you know, 90% of the deck builders, it's not like those. There is actually some uh, more layers and interesting depth in terms of the actual deck building mechanics in the game. And what it is, is you just are piloting uh, other animals to pick you up. You are a sloth. You're a, you're a slow sloth, but you have other animals to help you become fast. And you have to go around and collect your food from all these different trees. And you're playing, so nobody owns these animals. So there's eagles, there's like a unicorn, there could be humans, there's ants, there's crocodiles, all that kind of stuff. Not crocodiles, it's alligators because they're in fresh water. Um, and so you manipulate those by playing cards and drafting new cards every turn. And then other players can manipulate him too. So there's a kind of an interesting kind of watching that's going to happen in terms of what, who's taking what and all that. Really cool, fun game, fast slot. Uh, definitely like in the middle, mid-weight, lightweight style game. But there is some nuance replayability here. And uh, you can like, I think that you have, what is it, six animals that you can have. And I think there's probably 12 that come with the game. That could be off on the numbers. So you can mix and match those and have just a variety of plays. I know there's an expansion map. So there's like, with all the expansions and everything, there's like six different maps maybe. So yeah, so there's some replay and some configurability there you can do with fast slots. Definitely recommend this one too. Uh, next one is from Uwe Rosenberg, and I forget the publisher. Uh, the game is Nova Luna. And this is, um, God, it's sort of in the vibe of uh, Patchwork but not it's a, it's kind of a sidestep there it's a completely different flavor game it's not two player only we played it i think we played it with four and it has this cool sort of i don't know if it's like a rondelle but it's like a clock thing so that's kind of like patchwork we have that sort of time clock thing and then you jump up and you pick up pieces and they're all these like squares and you're trying to like join these gems together. And the gems will either score other patterns of tiles that you have and they'll kind of start new patterns that you have to sort of complete so they kind of double up on each other. Uh, that's the only way I'm going to explain it. I think there's some good videos on, on it. So if you want to get into the mechanics, but it's really a fun, uh, quick, you know, I'd almost call it in the filler arena but it is some really cool, good, crunchy uh, things to chew on here. I would say this is probably a little bit better at the two or three player count, although I played it four and enjoyed it, but I would like to try it with the lesser player count so that you can you can make some moves you know, to kind of build your own little engine of, of connecting these gems, but also in a way to sort of more intentionally block other players. With four, it's kind of too many cooks in the kitchen, so it's hard to really do any kind of direct, you know, <laughs> passive aggressiveness uh, with the thing. So, but it's really fun. I recommend folks that are really like light games and stuff to, to check out Nova Luna. All right, next one after that is, is a little bit older of a game. I think it's a year or two old, maybe even older, uh, is Time Chase. And this is a really crazy, lots of weird rules trick-taking game where this actually has time travel so you can go back and win tricks from previous rounds and it's mind-blowing i've got to pick this one up myself this is one you might see me review here if i can figure out you know i'm sure it's on amazon or something for like eight bucks or something uh you know really funky and i want to play it again you know uh because you know i'm, I'm sure we played it right but it was one of those where it was like I'm not sure I played it right, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't doing the right thing because the time travel thing, it wasn't until the end of the game and it was like, holy cow, this is awesome. Um, yeah, so that's it is. It's a trick-taking game. You can go back in time and win old tricks and like change Trump, you know, in, in whatever the Trump card is in the past and like win it and stuff and multiple people can jump back and that you're gonna spend like a little bit of a resource to do that. Really cool, really funky. I was very, very impressed by this and, and surprised by it. Uh, that's Time Chase. Definitely recommend folks to take a look at that. Now, the next one is not out yet. I think the Kickstarter for this is launching relatively soon, within a few weeks or maybe within a month or so. This is Return to Dark Tower. Now, I played this at BGG Con. The tower we played with there is, if you're not familiar with Return to Dark Tower, there's an old game with a giant tower that was like computerized from the 80s. They're redoing it and modernizing it and all that's rebuilding the tower. So the tower, the electronic tower that we played with at BGG Con, 
was uh, uh, generation behind the one that they did at PAX Unplugged the next week. Or it was two weeks out. It was next week, yeah. And I saw pictures of that one, and I was like, holy cow, this looks even better. And it moves, it makes sound, it spits skulls out that land on this map that's gonna like give, add blight and you know bad stuff to the board as you move around. There's an app that connects to it that drives the story, randomizes stuff, remembers events that you maybe failed or succeeded on, which will change the story of the game later. I was super impressed with this game. And so I'm real excited to see uh, you know what they come up with, even in sort of the state that the game was in, which was definitely, you know, we had like a beta tower. The board was not, you know, done graphic design wise. Um, you know, the, the designer Rob Davio was there and he was frank and he said, you know, the balance isn't there and you could tell some of the things. Like immediately when something would happen, he would say, oh no, we need to bump that up or down. Like you could see that it was, it was a real play test that we were doing and that gave me uh, a pretty good amount of confidence because the stuff he was saying, like, you know, it made sense to me, you know, and I'm an idiot. <laughs> I don't know anything about designing a game. So I'm like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense what he said. And he kept doing that like through the course of the whole game. And so I'm like, okay, good. So they're like on the ball and they really want to do a good experience. And frankly, it kind of reminded me a little bit, a little bit of Defenders of the Realm, the way that the players could move around the board and cooperate in different ways. Um, not mechanically, but just that same kind of vibe of, you know, I'll go here, help you put out this fire, you can be over here, you can help Billy, that kind of stuff. And you should be working on the main quest and there's a side quest that the app spit at us, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's a good kind of juggling of, uh, you know, what the responsibilities are of the players and stuff. And then you have this cool dynamic tower that's like breathing skulls and fire all over you and laughing at you and lighting up and stuff. <laughs> so that's really neat. So that's Return to Dark Tower. Recommend, take a look at the Kickstarter. I don't know much more about it than my playtest, but I think it's coming soon. The next game uh, we're gonna play is, I don't know how to say this, it's Similio or Similo? I think it's Similio. And uh, this is a really cool, fun social game. It kind of reminds me of that, what's that game, Who's, who, who, who is it or whatever, I can't remember the name of the game. So it's a bunch of these faces and you have, um, you have these cards, well, not just faces, they're like characters. So there's like different ones, there's like fantasy uh, deck and there's a historical deck. And so you shuffle it up and then you get, one player looks at the face and they know which one is the, you know, the right answer. And then, you know, you sort of, through the process of elimination, try to get, whittle it down to that. And I don't want to go over the exact mechanics. Definitely look at the video. It's very, very simple. Um, and it was really fun. We played this a number of times throughout BGG Con, actually. And uh, I should have just snagged a deck of it, but, you know, I just, too many things going on. Um, but I recommend wholeheartedly uh, folks take a look at Similio. It's, uh, it's a really kind of interesting, fun game, and it kind of fixes some of the problems of some of the other games that are like this, where you're like trying to pick out, you know, uh, uh, you know, trying to deduce based on just an image of somebody's face. Uh, the way the mechanics work with sort of, uh, it has a sort of binary uh, thing, but it's sort of, it's also very gray, the way that you sort of play cards to help the players deduce it. And I can't, I'm not gonna say it accurately, so, but definitely take a look at that one. It's a really, really fun, fun, fun game. That's Similio. Next one. So we have a four more, <laughs> just so you know where we're at. There's a lot of games. Um, this is uh, this is from uh, uh, Haba Games, and this is uh, Fiverr Findin', and this is a, this is frankly a, a roll and write, and I just I I don't know I, I shouldn't say this I just don't like roll and writes. Like if you tell me something's roll and write, I'm just like mm. <laughs> you know. And so this one is actually uh, really neat because it's. It's sort of like a, a race kind of thing going on where you're trying to uh, roll and get these sets and then as sort of the clock sort of ticks down if you can't find, and there's a couple of different ways to play it too. And so, yeah, this is a tough one mechanically, but I just wanted to say about this one, I don't like rolling rights, really, I honestly don't. And then I don't go out of my way to find them and then to give them a bad review either. Um, but there's been a couple here and there that I've kind of enjoyed. And this one is, this is a different, interesting one that I kind of enjoyed. That's probably not somebody to pick up or try to review or anything. Uh, cause I, I can see myself getting kind of sick of it and that's just my own personal deal. 
But if you do like roll and writes, I think this is a very different kind of roll and write. And that was some of the things that was interesting to me. I would play this a few more times, I think, for sure. Uh, not something I would pick up and put in my collection or anything. But I would, if somebody brought it, it's definitely got a good half dozen plays or more for me before I know I'd probably uh, wear on me. So that's Fiverr Finding um, from uh, Haba Games. Now, another game from Haba that we played at uh, Board Game Geek Kong is Mayabi. And this is uh, from. Oh gosh, the guy that designed Karuba, Rudiger Dorn, and I think it's so. <laughs> I'll double check. But we'll throw the box up here with the rest of the stuff. But um, Mayabi, and it, it's sort of Karuba-ish. Like the vibe is Karuba-esque, but it's it's also not. It has this interesting. It's actually, in some ways, it's a little more interesting than Karuba. It's a little bit more. There's a little bit more game there that you can sort of, uh, you know, levers that you can pull. And so you're you're getting these tiles that are, are coming out and you're trying to build like these almost like little networks and stuff. And uh, you have these columns and rows that you can only play into a certain number of times, you know, per round. And then you are scaling up and down these different sort of uh, uh, terrains and things like that. It's it's really very abstract, but it's a it's a really good uh, you know new hobby game that's in that same vibe as uh, Karuba. I believe the other one is called Adventure Land, and I've seen there's been one or two more since then. Uh, but if you like that style game, this is like a perfect sort of thinky family game. There's not you know there's not so much going on. It's going to overwhelm people, but there's still. If you want to get into some folks that really want to sit there and tease and puzzle things out, um, then Myabi is definitely one to check out. All right, so two more. One is a this first one is a really old game. It's called Poison uh, from Reiner Knizia, and I think the game is no longer in print as Poison, but it is been kind of rethemed and stuff. And we played this one a little bit. I think we played twice, I think, and. Um, Really cool game. I would. I. I want to kind of seek this one out, and you know, throw it up there on the shelf of the the small boxes. Um, really interesting game. It, it's definitely an older game. You can't find it. Uh, and as it was explained to me, some of the themes and things like that uh, that it's gone through aren't really that interesting. But the idea is that you're trying to collect like one or two suits, and you're trying to get like the most of that. But then you don't want to collect the poison suit, which I think is always the green suit, and. Uh, and so you try not to do that kind of thing. And you know, there's poison cards, so you can kind of sort of, you know, poison the pot. It's because somebody, somebody's really trying to go after a certain color, and then you kind of just seed a little bit of uh, negativity in there for them. So there's a good balance between, you know, what that is. And of course, it's just like any trick-taking game where you're trying to uh, deal with the hand you've got. But it's really, really elegant and fun. And it's a high recommend for me. If I ever find the copy or whatever, I'll definitely do a review of it. And so the last one here, is I've been playing a lot of the new um, expansion packs for Marvel Champions. Uh, I got the Miss Marvel and the Captain America, and then the uh, the Green Goblin uh, villain pack. And I've had a chance to play both with Miss Marvel and Captain America, and play against both of the sort of the main uh, scenario decks of the villains. There's kind of two different uh, Green Goblins. There's one where he's like Norman Osborn. And then he has like his own alter ego. So he goes from Norman Osborn to the Green Goblin and there's some interesting mechanics there. And then the other one is when he's just the Green Goblin all the time and he's just brutal and, and, and <laughs> really mean. And that second one is probably, I think the hardest one. I haven't beat that one yet. I beat the first one. Uh, the first one is probably more interesting kind of mechanically and thematically of like why he switches back and forth and how you're trying to kind of manipulate him into getting and switching one way or the other so that you can defeat him and you know there's a lot of really cool interesting things to do with that and the other one is just straight up like he's just like vomiting uh, all of him and his minions and his henchmen at you and you just got to withstand it although i will say the kind of the last part of this, i've had a lot of fun with these i will say that the captain america hero feels like maybe the strongest hero uh out of all of the heroes so far and he's just got a lot of cool stuff. Like his shield is, I think it's his shield and his helmet are just like super defensive. And the shield is basically block all damage and the helmet is like, if he dies, then he doesn't die, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then the the Miss Marvel one is just, she's fine and she's, you know, she's good. She's like, seems to be about as equal as everybody else. The Captain America one seems, seems stronger. So what I'm trying to say is, the first Goblin scenario, I beat it with Captain America. So I don't know that I could, you know, 
It wasn't easy, but I mean, it was easy-ish. I don't know with Miss Marvel if it would be that easy. And then when I played the second scenario, I used Miss Marvel, and I she did fine, and I got to you know the second stage, and he, you know whittled them down, and then ended up dying. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll try Captain America against the second stage, and Miss Marvel against the first stage, since I have beaten one and not the other. But I recommend them. You know, it's cool, and uh, there's some interesting cards in there as far as the extra cards for the different aspects and the basic cards and all that stuff. And like I said, that first Green Goblin scenario is a real interesting kind of thematic. Uh, twist and a mechanical twist on um, you know what the villains are doing. The second one is just straightforward and just beat you up. <laughs> and like it's not really anything like exciting mechanics. It's like oh this sucks. I'm getting my ass kicked. Uh, it's just really strong and hard. Um, so that's that's all the stuff. So we're gonna jump in now to the 2010s, the teens, and then I want to say a couple things here uh, before I get started is. You will not see Pandemic Legacy Season 1 and Season 2 on here. Um, uh, I don't think for many of us, actually. Uh, well, okay, I'll, well, we'll see. I, I think I wrote one down. But for me, no, because they're no longer in my collection. So all the stuff on my top 10 is going to be stuff that's still around. It's still my favorite. It wasn't my it, Some of these weren't necessarily my favorite back in the year, but now have kind of, you know, escalated or whatever. Uh, I can definitely think of at least two of them. And then... Um, uh, the strong years for me were 2012, 2015, 2016. Like, that was rough. Like, for me to pick a game out of especially those three years, 12, 15, and 16, was like, I don't even know. It's Those are the years where you say, like, if you got, you know, 20 games from that year and that was your collection, you'd be like, you'd be pretty good to go, like, for a year or a couple of years. You know, depending on how often you play games. So those are some really strong, for me, uh, years there. So let's jump into 2010. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a list of names over here. And you're going to see everybody and what they picked. And then I'll reveal what I pick. And so you'll see some crossover between them, which you can see here, or with me, or vice versa. So first we've got Evil Zack with Seven Wonders. We've got two Zacks. So underneath him you can see... Not Evil Zack, some little Evil Zack. Uh, London, and then Sean is Hanabi. Tomas is uh, Seven Wonders as well. Jameis is London. Michael is Seven Wonders. Uh, Brian is Merchants and Marauders. And E, he wanted to be called E, is Twa. And then somebody, I think it was E, filled out Billy and he put Twa. So these guys all know the games that I loathe. <laughs> so any game that isn't marked Billy is probably my least favorite game from the year. Yeah, I don't know, everybody likes Twa, I don't. Um, so that's that, so you can see a lot of people like Seven Wonders and uh, Merchants and Marauders from Brian there. That's one I haven't played. I know they, the folks there have played it a couple of times. They really like it, it's one that they wanna kinda of get back to the table and play some more. I think they have the expansion too, um, but uh, you might see another game from that same designer show up uh, on the list here. And you might see something else actually on this list show up later, which, um, actually, no, you won't. Never mind. <laughs> uh, so mine is uh, Defenders of the Realm. This is, uh, if you watch my top 50 games of all time, this is like, I think my favorite co-op or one of, well, no, it's right, it's in the top 10 or something of the games of all time. But this is kind of my favorite pure sort of old school uh, co-op game. Uh, I really, really, really enjoy it. Um, it stayed in the rotation for me. This is one of the games I like to solo a little bit. Uh, and I played it with my game group and my family as well. And, you know, it's been a pretty good hit across the board. There is going to be supposedly a second edition from the little bit I've looked into it. It's not going to be anything like this. So, like, I'm not really planning on getting rid of this. I got I mean, I'm going to look with, like, a real BDI if they ever do come out with Defenders of the Realm 2nd Edition. <laughs> and if it's not actually like Defenders of the Realm, then I'm not going to worry too much about it. It might be fine by itself, but there's that. So that's it gives you an idea of the, the stuff that people like. I remember back then, uh, 2010, 2011, we were playing a lot of Seven Wonders um, uh, with these folks. And that's this is about the time I started playing uh, with this group. It was about 2010. It was towards the end. It was towards the end of 2010 I started playing with them. And I started getting back into gaming again. I'd taken like sort of a break. I had a regular game group there for a few years up until 2008 or so. And then that group kind of just fizzled. And that group ran for like five years, you know, 2003, four, and then into 2008. And then we stopped hanging out so much. And then 
uh, you know, then I found this other group and I found Ascension with some of my other friends. That was really kind of sucked me back into board game geek was playing Ascension. Uh, long story there. That's, I've talked about it before in the podcast. So, but then I, I found this group uh, through, was it through BDG? Well, I actually work with Sean here. And he, and so he was like, oh no, we've got a group here. And so we started playing. And I remember we played Seven Wonders quite a bit. I know I played like Balsar Galactica with the, for the first time with them. And uh, some just some fond memories of playing that and some of those old Dungeons and Dragons games like Wrath of a Shardalon and Ravenloft and stuff like that. And uh, Euro games and uh, some other games, which we'll see here in a second. So that's 2010. And then we're gonna show 2011 here and Evil Zack. Pictomania, which I forgot how fun of a game that is. Uh, of course, Evil Zack would pick it. <laughs> and Other Zack is Or at Labora, which I don't really like that game. Um, and then Sean, Castles of Burgundy. I played a lot of Castles of Burgundy back then. And Sean and I actually played at lunch at least once that I can remember. And I remember we were like burning through it. Like it was just him and I playing at lunch back then. And we could we could burn through a game in about 45 minutes. Tomas liked the Lord of the Rings LCG. That's a great game. Jameis, Last Will, uh, Michael, Castles of Burgundy. So there's another one. And then Brian and E both Eclipse, uh, which is, you know, that would that would definitely be in the running for my best personally out of this group for the year would be Eclipse. But for me, it is Urban Sprawl. To me, this is the quintessential uh, city building game of board gaming. Uh, there is no other that comes close to this. I talk a lot about this, um, you know, on podcasts and things and top 10 lists and all that. So this is, this is for me, uh, the best. And, you know, unfortunately the designer actually passed away at the end of last year in 2019, Chad Jensen. Um, so that's unfortunate, but you know, as much of a small gift as this is this if for his life, this is a great gift. Um, and he's got a lot of other games too. Um, but yeah, so this is this is something definitely special to me, and it's just a fantastic game. Great city building game. It's just it's big and chunky and complex, and it's got a lot of chaos. But it's like it's you can you can bridle it a little bit too, which is what I like, and which is what a city building should do. It should throw the kitchen sink at you. <laughs> like you can't just like it's not just going to be fun time. Have you have you run a city? Like who? All right. Oh, and then I forgot Billy at the bottom there. He likes quarriers because Billy's a dumbass. <laughs> anyway, and so that's 2011. Whoops. And then 2012, we're going to show up here. We've got Evil Zack, Keyflower. Great game. That was one of my favorites there. Other Zack is Terra Mystica. Sean and Tomas like Star Wars X-Wing. Jameis like Archipelago. I don't know why. That's not a good game. <laughs> <laughs> and then Michael likes Zulkin. I like that game. You can see E also likes Zulkin and Brian likes Mage Wars. Uh, Brian and I over the years have played uh, Mage Wars together and uh, definitely this was one of my favorite games of all time and then I started getting into like you know Age of Sigmar miniature games. Uh, Mage Wars is really a miniature game. You know it's a it's there's not miniatures there's cards but it plays out with like a lot of complex spells and things like that. You know I started playing Frostgrave too which basically is kind of what Mage Wars ends up kind of being in a lot of ways. So if you like, if you if you're kind of new-ish to my channel the last couple of years, you know, and you're you're here because I've done some Frostgrave stuff or whatever, you've gotten into Frostgrave uh, recently. I would say take a look at Mage Wars, and it's got some real cool, interesting uh, stuff there in terms of like the wacky spells and everything. Here, I don't want to spoil anything by stacking this up. And then mine for 2012 is going to be Clash of Cultures here. And again, I say this all the time, I this is so high on my list with the expansion, which is, I think, impossible to find. Although, I think some came around. So there, this is being reprinted, though. This is, this you cannot really find this too much. I think you can find the base game, you know, randomly out there. Um, but it is being play tested and developed. I believe it's been signed. I don't think anything is like supposed to be public. I don't know anything specifically, but if you go to the BG form for that, there are some threads on play testing and stuff. So it is in process of getting reprinted. It may be, you know, in uh, 2022, let's say for the 10th anniversary. So it might be a year or two off, but they are working on it. And this is my favorite civilization game. This is something I've played with the group um, a number of times. And there's another fellow on here. His name's not on this list, um, but uh, I, I know he really likes it too. And we look forward to it. And uh, and Brian, he's, he's liked it as well. Um, Brian Brian probably leans more Ameritrash. 
I'll talk about more about these folks as we kind of get through. But you can kind of see through some of the games that I'm showing here. <laughs> and then Billy likes uh, uh, La Venise du Nord, which is a terrible game. <laughs> Like I said, Billy's dumb, you know, what can I say? Billy is a big idiot. This is a running joke in my group. Um, I just call them Billy when they're doing something stupid. And then, uh, okay, so 2013, sorry, distracted. So we'll show the list here. Evil Zack likes Concordia. Um, that That has got a ton of play. You can see it the, going down there. Um, uh, Michael also likes Concordia. This game, man, I mean, I was getting a little sick of it, actually. I like Concordia, it's fine. Uh, actually like transatlantic better, which is not a normal thing, but um, Concordia's good. Caverna, you can see uh, other Zach's got Caverna. Sean likes Love Letter. We played a ton of that at lunch um, back then. Uh, Tomas likes the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Uh, James likes the Brussels 1893. That's an excellent game. That's kind of uh, flown under the radar, I believe, for the last several years. I'm not sure if it's been in print though, but that's a good one. Brian Eldritch Horror. Then an E, Northern Pacific, I don't know, some 18XX nonsense. Uh, Eric likes that, or E likes that stuff. <laughs> anyway, so I don't, I really don't know what Northern Pacific is. <laughs> and then uh, Joel, oh, Billy likes Via Appia, which is also terrible. Don't listen to Billy. And then mine is Caverna, which is the same as other Zach, which is kind of a, almost a running thing now, is we're like, you know, we'll both say, hey, let's play Caverna, and neither of us have brought the game. And so I haven't played this since, last time I played this was with uh, my family, because uh, we usually set up and play like the, not the easy mode, but you know, the one without all the buildings. Um, so that's that's mostly how I play this game. I'd like to sit down with Zach and and uh, some other folks there in the group and play this some more. Uh, Caverna is an excellent game, you know, that's is my, this is my my Rosenberg, you know, like I like enough of his games, the Lahav and the Grickle and all that stuff, but Caverna is really my favorite uh, from 2013. So moving on to 2014, uh, Evil Zack has One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, other Zack has Orleon, Sean likes Splendor. We, I swear to God, we played Sweat Splendor a lot at, at lunch. Um, at least like 60 times, like we played it so much. And Tomas, Dead of Winter, that was a big, huge staple in our group back then. Uh, we've, we, you know, I think we've kind of played it to death, honestly, as well. Uh, Jameis, Golden Ages, that's a great civilization game. Michael is Clask, which if you don't know what that is, it's a little like kind of dexterity game. It's kind of like playing foosball, but different. And uh, we just played the new one the other day. It's like four player Clask which was really cool and fun too. Uh, Brian, Shadows of Brimstone, hang on. And then E likes Alchemist, which gives me a headache. And Billy picked Bedpans and Brimsticks, which should be set on fire and should have never been published. <laughs> and so Joel, where's his box? Joel also has Shadows of Brimstone. And this is just an expansion box. This is not one of the 10 boxes of stuff that I have for Shadows of Brimstone. Uh, Brian, let's see, Brian, Evil Zack, I think Jameis, E, and Sean all have like jumped into games too. Uh, we were playing Shadows of Brimstone mm, sort of regularly for a little while. I think we're up to like, uh, some people are probably up to level six or seven. You can max, you sort of max out at level eight in that game. Uh, but yeah, that's been, that's, that's, that's probably my favorite dungeon crawl style light RPG game, Shadows of Brimstone. Uh, we, you know, we need to play it again. It's just a matter of like time and there's like new games coming out. So we're like, oh, let's play new stuff, you know? Um, but Shadows of Brimstone is fantastic. It's silly and wacky. And I just love that game. Uh, well, the one, one thing I want to talk about was One Night Ultimate Werewolf. This is another game where like, man, we played this one. This is probably easily the most played game of of the game group for the last, you know, 10 years. It's for, in terms of numbers of plays. Now for me, I don't think it's really that great until you add Daybreak, which is the expansion that came out the following year. And, uh, cause I enjoyed it. Like, you know, we played it, the, the base game back then. I had a good time, but then when they added like Daybreak and then whatever the next expansion was too, it was really, really fun. We just had like a black, every, every single game night that we played, we would either begin or end this with like 10 <laughs> games of One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Just so much, so much. Now it would be on my list. It'd be tough for me. 
um, between Brimstone and One Night because it's, you know, they're completely different games. So, but if I have to pick a game, you know, it'd be tough. But I got another one that actually replaced for me One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which we'll get to in a minute. So 2015, yeah, I did. So Evil Zack, Pandemic Legacy Season 1, which arguably I could add there too. But again, I finished it and played it. Yeah. The Gallerist from Other Zack, Codenames from Sean, uh, Tomas Raiders of the North Sea, Jameis Time Stories. Jameis, Jameis is a little bit of a maverick. He's a rebel. He likes bad games once in a while. Time Stories is an example of that. I'm just giving him grief. I don't like Time Stories. Michael Jiraku. This is a very, very under the radar game that we played a bunch of in the group. Uh, I believe Tasty Mintral has their printing of it. It's a weird trick-taking area control game. It's really funky. I don't know that I've done a review of it because I don't have a copy. And I think they printed not many copies. I think Michael might be the only one with a copy in a group, although somebody else might have it. But if you can track one of these copies down, Draku, then uh, take a look at it. Uh, Brian Argent's The Consortium. That's another really cool, funky game. I like that game a lot that year. And then E has uh, Lignum. And I didn't realize that it actually had come out this long ago in 2015, because I know they did like a second edition. Oh, I didn't even know it was second edition. But it came out a couple years ago, and that was the one everybody was kind of talking about. But uh, I think he marked it here. Although I think the 2015 edition has some printing issues or some rule book issues or something. Um, but I've not had a chance to play this. And this got some play, though, in the group. Um, but more recently. And then Billy plays Churchill because, like I said, you know, he's an anarchist. He doesn't care what people like or he doesn't care about game design. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to bag these games too much. But it's, when I see the word Billy, I'm like, you know, I see red. Uh, mine is Forbidden Stars. Forbidden Stars is one of my all-time uh, favorite games, and uh, you know, I, I, a lot of this stuff is sort of like in my top 25 games of the top 50 list that I did, you know, a few months ago at the end of last year. Uh, unfortunately, Forbidden Stars is out of print, and is probably never ever going to be in print. Um, obviously, I don't know what it sells for on the market. I would try it before you pay probably whatever it's being sold for. Um, but I would, if you try it and like it, then I would certainly, you know, obviously pick it up. Um, but yeah, Forbidden Stars for me is definitely um, one of the all-time great Space X something games. That's 2015. Okay, so 2016. Uh, so crossover here, you can see Evil Zack has uh, Arkham Horror LCG which I really enjoy. And you can see all the way the, down a couple, Tomas also Arkham Horror LCG. And I know, I think Zach and Tomas have played through a lot of those campaigns together. Um, I kind of stopped after that first, first uh, you know, expansion campaign, whatever it was that came after that. And I'm into really into Marvel Champions now, which to me was would sort of like knock this one off and Lord of the Rings, uh, personally. And then Zach, the other Zach likes the colonists. And then Sean likes Terraforming Mars, Tomas, Arkham Horror LCG, Jameis Mansions of Madness. This is where, you know, Jameis is making a comeback here. You know, he's kind of on the right track. Mansions of Madness, excellent game. Uh, we played a lot of games of this uh, within the group. And it's just, it's a really good time. When this came out, um, you know, we, we went through, I think, all of the uh, scenarios that were in the base game and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, really, just, there's some, a lot of good fond memories of, of trying to you know, win these different scenarios and stuff like that. Uh, Manchester has really just a great, great storytelling uh, vehicle. One of the best um, that I've seen in the game. It's not my top 50 or anything anywhere, but it's one of those where, you know, it probably should be in my top 50, but it's not like a typical game that I'm into that much. And, but, you know, at the, when the chips are down, if you say, you know, Manchester Manus, it's, it's an excellent game. Well, probably one of the best games of all time in terms of design and stuff, honestly. Uh, Michael, Great Western Trail, Brian, Vinos Deluxe, E. Docmas. Like, what is that game? I don't know what that is. This is are you just trying to be, you trying to be difficult? Like, I think he is. And then Billy, obviously, he's, he is trying to be difficult with Space Poo. That's a game. I know, there's a Poo card game, there's a Space Poo card game. But uh, Michael and I both love Great Western Trail. Uh, Michael has the expansion. I've actually had a chance to play the expansion with his copy. I do not have the expansion. I don't know about the expansion. This man is cool. I don't know that it's like an, a must get. I want to get it, you know, just to have it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah, it's a, a Great Western Trail. Again, this is one of my favorite like Euro style strategy games. Um, it's from what's his name Alexander Fister, but I'm really excited to try Mark Hybo, which I know Brian tried at a convention um, over in Seattle, and I think I don't remember who else, but I know I've talked to Brian about it, um, and so that's not it's not quite over here yet. I know Brian. I think Brian's gonna copy, I'm not sure, but we'll see. And then I know it's coming out like next month in February here. So um, that should be interesting. But yeah, Great Western Trail is really good. I'm really excited for Mark Kylo too. And uh, so that's 2016. 2017, lots of crossover here. Evil Zach and Regular Zach both have Gaia Project. Uh, Sean and Tomas both have Gloomhaven. Uh, Jameis has Seventh Con and I haven't had a chance to price play seventh continent but i've talked to james a little bit about it he's really enjoyed it and i know he's played through a good chunk of it uh michael really likes heaven and ale uh brian likes too many bones i didn't you know that's fine e likes time of crisis that's a really good game um we played this a few times i think e and i together uh and then another fella in the group and some other of these some other of these folks and uh we had a really good time with uh, time of crisis uh billy of course likes alien artifacts which is probably the only awful game that portal games ever made well until we get the next year <laughs> and then so that's billy and then i like werewords and um this is what's replaced one night ultimate werewolf for me and we've played this a lot you know over the last year or two um not as much as one night ultimate werewolf but, you know, we're getting there. And this is one that I'll always, you know, try to remember to throw in the bag. And other folks in the group have it. This is one where we'll play it, you know, if it, if it, if it comes out five, six times, you know, after, or before, or during uh, a game night. But I've talked at length about why it replaces it for me in the review of, of that game as well as in my top 50 list. But just know that really, to me, this is, this is a, a major achievement in terms of like that social deduction style game. I won't really get sick of this because it's got that extra layer going on beyond just you're lying, no, you're lying. It's got other things going on besides that. So that's 2017. 2018 just just feels like last year, but it's <laughs> now it's two years ago, sort of. Uh, Evil Zach has a root, which we'll get we'll get back to you, Evil Zach. Uh, other Zach has Underwater Cities, great, excellent game. Um, although I, I really want to try the expansion because there's that strategy that's sort of like busted and I haven't tried the expansion yet. Uh, Sean likes Just One, which is great. Um, you know, my family loves Just One. We just play it to death. Now, Tomas has Mage Knight Ultimate, which Mage Knight, I think it was a 2012 game. So, but he's got the Ultimate, which is like every, all the expansions and everything. But, you know, I think Tomas must like the solo this one. This is why it's on the list. Uh, Jameis Chronicles of Crime, great. Back on track, Jameis, keep it up. <laughs> uh, Michael likes Underwater Cities. Uh, Brian, Lords of Hellas. Uh, Brian and I, we share, you know, I like a lot of Euro games and stuff, and Brian does too, um, but we share a lot of these kind of Ameritrash things in common um, with that. Uh, so Lords of Hellas, I think, an excellent game. I think me and him are like, you know, oh yeah, Shadows of Brimstone, Lords of Hellas. There's certain games that we'll both like. We don't like all the same games, but there's a couple that we'll kind of both like, and then, you know, nobody else really will like it, <laughs> um, and that kind of thing. So E likes Root, great, and then Billy, of course, likes Detective from Portal, which is the other game I forgot. I don't like that game either <laughs> from Portal. Um, now Root is on here twice, and Evil Zach was. Let's be honest. He was. He was. An, he's annoying about how much he wants to play Root. He's not. I'm just teasing. If he watches this, <laughs> uh, but man, he was bringing Root like he was obsessed with Root. Like it was like, I mean, it it was it was almost like, like a disease in a way that he had, but you know he really loved root and it, I don't know how many I think he's played it dozens of times, um, and I like root and it's a fine game. But if you watch my list for my favorite games from last year, you'll see another game that I think is better. That's from the same designer. Oh, and then for me, let's take a look. My best game, this feels this feels like yesterday, even though it's like two years ago, not really. Uh, Blackstone Fortress, uh, fantastic, fantastic game. Uh, you will see some more videos actually for this game come out later in the year, probably a couple of months from now. Um, so yeah, it's just a great, 
co-op dungeon crawl. You can play it head to head. They've done a really good job with the expansions, messing with the difficulty, improving theoretically, although I haven't played it, the uh, the one versus many side of it. They've added, they've fleshed out some of the campaign stuff, some of those sort of the leveling up kind of stuff. Um, really, really cool, fun game. Uh, that's Blackstone Fortress. Again, I talked a lot about it over a little bit in earlier last year and then definitely at the end of 2018 um, there. So now we'll get into 2019 and uh, you can see Evil Zack has Pax Premier 2nd Edition, which let's just get it out of the way because this is this last video I posted was this one. So mine is also Pax Premier 2nd Edition from the same designer as Root. Absolutely love this game. Fantastic. Uh, Other Zack has On Mars which I've had a chance to play twice now. And I know Other Zack was going back and forth between Barrage and On Mars as for his favorite game of 2019. Eh, I have a hard time calling those 2019 games because they're not even here yet. I mean, On Mars came to backers, I think, the, like the last week of December. So, but yeah, it's his favorite game of, of 2019. On Mars is fantastic, Barrage is fantastic. You'll be seeing a review of Barrage, I think, next week for me. I've had a chance to play it a few times now. Uh, but moving on, uh, Sean Azul, Summer Pavilion. We played a ton of Azul uh, a couple years ago at lunch, and he is really in love with this new one. He's played a lot of it with his family and stuff. I haven't had a chance to play uh, Summer Pavilion yet, but he said he's, he said he's really, really enjoying that one. Uh, Tomas, Marvel Champions. Tomas likes his LCGs, um, and that's a good good choice. Jameis, Crystal Palace, another capstone game. They had so many games last year. I think I talked about Maracaibo a minute ago, uh, Ragusa, I had Watergate on my uh, top 10 list, uh, Crystal Palace, everything. You know, that's just, they had like, I think I was listening to some podcasts they were saying like last year was the year of capstone. And I was like, yep. <laughs> uh, Michael has Slide Quest. Uh, Slide Quest is fantastic. He, I know he's been playing it with his family a bunch and, uh, and they've had a, a, a great time playing that. Uh, and then uh, Brian, Cloudspire. Brian and I have, have played Cloudspire. And uh, this is, it's a great game. Like I said, does that kind of, that similar, we like some of the similar style of Ameritrash games. Those head-to-head -head games, lots of abilities and stuff. Like a Mage Wars, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's an excellent game. That was, I think, number four or five on my top ten list. Maybe six, I don't remember exact order, but yeah, that was on my top 10 list from last year. And then E, coming back to kind of save the day, I haven't played this game, it's called The Crew, and I really wanted to play this. It seems like a very, very interesting game. Uh, I'm excited to play it. So I think it's like a weird trick-taking game. I can't remember the exact sort of ideas there. Uh, so yeah, so that's The Crew. And then of course, Billy likes uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Mr. Norrell from Osprey Games, which is not a, not really a good game. Uh, I think all of Billy's games, everybody else does not like, except for uh, Twa. Some people like Twa in my group. All his other games, I think to a, to a person, no, none of the rest of my group liked either, so it's not just me picking on the game. <laughs> uh, but then of course, my, my last one here is Pax Mirror. So that was kind of a, a neat thing. You can kind of see there from the list, you know, some, like, uh, other Zach, he likes his Euros, you know, he's really into that. And the, most of the rest of us are kind of, like, all over the place. There's some Euros there, Great Western Trail, but, you know, Michael also likes Slide Quest, and uh, Tomas likes his uh, LCGs, and uh, Tomas likes a little bit more of the Ameritrash stuff. Um, you know, Brian kind of is that same way, too, but there's some mixed-in uh, Euro stuff. Like, I think I can probably, um, with this group of folks, I can probably play just about anything. Uh, with Ameritrash or Euro, if there's like choices, you know they'll definitely go one way or the other. Uh, even even other Zach, who is pretty much just a Euro fella, um, he will, you know, teeth pulled play, you know, where words or an Ameritrash game, as long as there's something to it, you know, that kind of thing. And there's some other folks in the group that didn't participate. Um, you know, we're, we all have our kind of tendencies to go different ways, but uh, our, people are usually open about it and like, we don't have problems. It's like, I'm not playing that crap, you know, <laughs> because if they don't like that style, they're like, well, we won't play it. We'll play something else that everybody wants to play. It's easy. Um, anyway, so that's kind of the, the best of the decade, kind of a weird exercise, but uh, gave me a kind of a chance to sh highlight some stuff and my group came up with the idea. So I was like, I'm stealing it. And then everybody give me your list and then I'll throw it up there. And uh, so that's what happened. So there you go. There's the video. 
And uh, I will be doing the other video of my favorite movies of the decade because I always get asked about stuff like that, like pop culture stuff. And that was the one I could I could stretch myself to sort of see doing, but I'll talk more about that. I'm gonna post both these videos at the same time. So that's that. Thanks.